This video is brought to you by you. About a week ago, my laptop broke down and I feared I wasn't gonna be able to make videos anymore. But through your help, I was able to upgrade from a little integrated graphics computer to something so much better that, I mean, I can make amazing content now, really well edited. And really, I only have you guys to thank. So to everyone that helped out from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Back to the video. This is Rocco, my childhood family dog. He's an eight-year-old boxer and we got both him and his sister Crispy from a tío who bred dogs in LA. He was getting tired of the business and was ready to throw both of them out on the street. And thankfully he quit because they're a little slow. I mean, they're like super inbred. So I think that might be why he's a guard dog and not a very good one. He's a bumbling oaf who looks scarier than he is. Rocco was born with an undescended testy. I'd show you, but I'm not trying to get demonetized. Basically, his balls didn't drop. I don't do anything without Googling it first, so I immediately knew that if we didn't neuter him, he would probably get cancer. We needed to neuter him. So I decided to bring it up to my dad, right? And he's this really typical Latino patriarch. So I went up to him and I'm like, dad, we need to neuter Rocco or he's probably gonna get cancer. And he was all, buh, 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 buh. we're not removing my dog's balls. That's his manhood. But dad, buh, 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 buh. <laughs> whatever, that's the take, dude. That's the fucking that's take. Exactly yeah. <laughs> so we didn't do anything. His sister got spayed and you can guess why we had the double standard, but Rocco's balls, we can't touch those. And everything was fine for a few years, but it soon became a really big problem. His undescended trophy started growing and growing and growing until it was so big that he started urinating blood. He was dying and it didn't look like he was going to make it. The situation was really, really bad and something must have clicked in my dad's head because he decided to take him to the vet. He and his sister had never been apart for their entire lives. So this was going to be a really big change. We helped him up onto the cage and said our goodbyes and waited, waited for hours. The vet called back and he was stable. We had to monitor him for the next couple of days to make sure nothing grew back, but that was it. <laughs> he had made it. It's been a few years now and he hasn't gotten another growth again. All this worrying and money over something that was entirely preventable because of a backward obsession with a dog's balls. I remember talking with my dad immediately after this, you know, being like, I told you so. And all I got was a single, huh. Dogs. It's about as hard to talk about dogs as it is to talk about raising kids. No matter what you say, someone's gonna get mad. I mean, just mentioning that these two are outside guard dogs is probably going to make some of you send an animal abuse report to PETA or something. Still, after all this happened, a mystery began for me. My dog almost died and I wanted to hold something accountable. Clearly, the culprit here was my dad, right? That's what I thought for a long time. It was a tale of old school Latino machismo that almost got my dog killed. But something wasn't sitting right with me. His sister, Crispy, got sick a few years after him. She had a similar growth on her underside. Thankfully, she made it too, but two close calls, you know, that close together, something wasn't right. And after doing some research, I was convinced that this was a targeted assassination. And not in the way, say, a robber will poison a dog before a break-in. This was even bigger. An assassination attempt over 200 years in the making. This is how machismo almost killed my dog. My journey started, maybe unsurprisingly, on Twitter. If you've ever been around Latinx Twitter, you are probably familiar with videos of Latino dads being super affectionate with their pups, with the caption saying something like, My dad then. No quiero pinches perros en esta casa. My dad now. And the meme doesn't come from nowhere either. Over time, countries like Mexico have seen a rise in dogs as companions, as opposed to dogs as workers or guard dogs. With the rising levels of wealth, the middle class in Mexico is pampering their dogs as much as people from the United States. 
Now this Latin American internet trend is way different from the pupper memes that arose a few years back. Images or videos of dogs with text narrating their internal thoughts and dialogues. They made dogs human. And for my white western viewer, this is probably how you see dogs already. Little furry people with an internal world of their own. Clearly, there is a whole lot of variance in the way dogs get treated in this world. In one country, we have both dogs in silly outfits, as well as rooftop dogs, dogs that are chained up for their entire lives, strays. The dog inequality is real. And maybe this is why Rocco almost died. Compared to a middle class pup, Rocco lives outside. He doesn't get as much exercise or attention, and he's fed the cheapest food available. But could his quality of life really lead to his disease? Possibly. Quality of life absolutely does play a role in the lifespan of a dog. While researching this video, I found the story of a farmer whose dogs lived up to 20 to 25 years. With a special diet and a lifestyle that involves walking and running all day, canines can live a really, really long time. So I decided to look into the various doggy lifestyles out there. And there are a whole lot. I mean, there are 900 million dogs worldwide. And the vast majority of them are free-ranging dogs who live in packs. Take the dogs in places like Moscow. The local dogs have created an intricate pecking order where the most intelligent dog, not the strongest, is made the alpha. These guys are so smart they've learned how to use the metro to get around. And I still get lost taking the bus. Compared to other countries, the dogs in Moscow have it pretty chill. At least when you look at other countries like India. About 20,000 people die due to rabies every year in India. The highest of any country in the world. And so the country has to resort to some extreme measures of dealing with the problem. Dog culling and extermination are often inhumane and brutal ways of dealing with street dogs. Bludgeoning them to death is simple, but inefficient. Mass poisonings are often used, but to cause an extended and painful death. You can always load a truck up with dogs, fill it with knee deep water, and turn on the electricity. These methods are cruel. Maybe if Rocco was left out in the box as my Theo had originally planned, he, like thousands of other dogs, every single year would have been sent to a kill shelter. That would have been it. So considering how much better or worse Rocco could have had it, well, I think he had a pretty good life. His quality of life wasn't the culprit, and I needed to find a new lead. But I couldn't leave his international brothers and sisters on their own. There had to be a solution to the brutal methods of extermination, and Raul Segal was just our guy. The Asia director of the animal welfare NGO, Humane Society International, takes a more practical approach when dealing with dog culling. He describes how the capital, Thimphu, was plagued with packs of wild dogs that would howl through the night. It was a blight on the otherwise spotless image the government was presenting to growing numbers of high-end tourists. Year after year, countries try to cull their dogs, but the problem is still there. So they tried a new method mass spaying campaigns to prevent the population from growing. See, dogs have a unique ecosystem where simply removing the top dogs just gets them replaced by others. Providing stability to the ecosystem by spaying and neutering the wild dogs is the only way to ensure the population is kept in check. And the project, now in its sixth year, has been a resounding success. Change is absolutely possible, and an ethical way to treat our furry friends is available. If you want to support the Humane Society International, the links are down in the description. So that was that. Now I need to find a new lead. Rocco wasn't the only one born a bit defective. Crispy occasionally has difficulty breathing, especially when she was younger. Her breathing holes seem a little bit too small for her, and they both seem to struggle with overheating. They can't handle hot days as much as their adopted cousin Lola, and I have to hose them down after a hot day or a long run. The growth Crispy had on her underbelly was, according to the veterinarian, a skin tumor unique to boxer dogs. So maybe it was their bloodline, all the inbreeding my Theo did. I did a little research on the breed, and what do you know? Boxer dogs are especially susceptible to cancer and have trouble with heat regulation. There wasn't a whole lot of information as to why, but there was a whole lot of information on breed personality types. <laughs> Yay! 
Boxer dogs are perfect for my personality type. I'm an ENCP, and these guys are fun and playful, yet dignified and loyal. Unlike a pit bull who's loving, energetic, and loyal, nothing like me. Or a Labrador. Those guys are friendly, good-natured, and energetic. The complete opposite. Okay, I'll stop. But why do all these dog personality types sound like my zodiac sign? A matter of breeding, a biting history of pedigree dogs, and the quest for status would have all the answers to my investigation. So I talk a lot about modernism on this channel, right? And one of the effects modernism had on the European world way back when was that people began to develop a fascination with science. Well, the Europeans really wanted to be all mad scientists, and so they used the science at the time to bioengineer newer, better, and stronger breeds, also known as eugenics. The first breeders were obsessed with the purity of bloodlines and, you know, stereotypically evil shit. If a puppy had a slight defect, they'd be cold from the pack. And I'm using air quotes here because a defect could be something as small as having the wrong coat color. Obviously, eugenics and humans fell out of favor with the moneyed whites after they, like, fought a whole war about the purity of bloodlines thing, but, uh, eugenics in dogs is very much still a thing. Take the breed standards used by kennel clubs to judge a dog's worthiness. The language of eugenics is embedded into these documents. Degenerate, undesirable, mongrelization, all terms that echo a past mired by eugenics. The wicket used to measure dog snouts? Hmm, where have we seen these before? Oh, right. Tramp is a cute name for a stray mutt, but it's less cute when you remember that it was the same word used to describe a woman forced into an involuntary sterilization. Tramps. And look, eugenics in humans and eugenics in dogs are not the same thing. Some behavioral differences in breeds are real. But the scary part here is that the difference is not as defined as we'd think or these websites would have you believe. In A Matter of Breeding by Michael Brando, the author describes how eugenics and humans didn't fall out of favor because it was widely discredited by science or anything like that. The reason eugenics fell out of favor was largely a cultural issue. The war really shook white society to the core. I mean, just before, it, they were comfortable engaging with ideas that were essentially diet Nazism. And often, those ideas were a lot worse and scarier than even the Germans were comfortable with. But once fascism reared its ugly head, they had to come to terms with what Western society had wrought upon itself. Were they comfortable engaging with the same ideas that had killed millions? Or would the seismic shock lead to a new era of racial unity and prosperity? Nah, let's just say it's cultural deficiencies and absent fathers instead of the size of their skulls. Crisis for whiteness averted, yay! And this is huge, y'all. Eugenics only fell off because it wasn't cool. If the Nazis hadn't taken the prank too far, we'd probably still have the same genocidal and eugenics-based policies like forced sterilizations of undesirables, just to name one. Here's the fucked up part. The eugenics of dog breeding never had the same cultural moment. No nation has ever tried to exterminate all of the labradoodles, so it never became uncool. Instead, the eugenics in dogs increased over the years. We learned that, yeah, sure, human cranial measurements, bad, okay. But extermination, purity of lineages, these are things that most nations are still cool with. And so rich people gleefully enacted their He's a liar! on our puppers. In the process, they created quite a few monsters. Look at this picture of a bull terrier and tell me you're not horrified. What the fuck is that? And apparently they suffer from compulsive behavioral issues? Now this one, hip dysplasia and eye disorders. Painful skeletal disease, major back problems, the genetic defect that gives the pug its curly tail can actually lead to total paralysis. It literally requires incredible effort for the bulldog to breathe normally. They're fucking abominations! But what about Rocco? Well, boxers are only about 150 years old, and their lineage began when Victorian breeders crossed the now extinct Brabanter Bullenbizer with the English Bulldog. When breeding, like with all other breeds, the breeders disregarded the health of their pets and bred dogs with flattened faces that caused heat dysregulation and a predisposition to cancers and tumors. This is the smoking gun, a lineage of irresponsible breeding to appeal to fucked up eugenics-based show standards. This is what almost killed Rocco, but it doesn't end there. 
You see, there's a clear hierarchy when it comes to dogs, and not just dogs, all animals. They are considered property, and that enables the creation of, well, this. And once they're property, they can be commodified, factory sealed, and sold just like anything else. Remember, the eugenics movement in dogs wasn't fueled by violent racism like it was with humans. Instead, eugenics in dogs was driven by the market. People weren't trying to make blonde and blue-eyed dogs because they hated chocolate labs, but because they knew that there was a market for specialized dogs. Here's a dog specialized for hunting, for fishing, for farming, for him, for her, for the kids. Again, I return to Rocco and the boxer. What was their niche? Well, they were bred to be a working dog. Specifically, police dogs. God fucking damn it, Rocco's a cop. So I can blame the police for almost killing my dog? Ironic when they kill thousands of dogs a year. Anyway, breeders knew exactly what they were doing. And for the most part, it was all a farce. The way a dog's ears tilt or the color of their coat have absolutely nothing to do with their personality or ability to be a good pet. Instead, the obsession with physical characteristics have led to not only a health epidemic, but a behavioral one too. The Cocker Spaniel is known for Cocker Rage Syndrome, because the century of inbreeding has severely fucked with them. Border Collies, on the other hand, have become the subject of study over their noise phobia. The extreme inbreeding has caused these animals to spend most of their time drooling, trembling, and staring at the wall, and scientists want to study them to discover the genetic basis of mental illness. Crossbreeds consistently test better than pure breeds on all fronts, and yet we still believe all kinds of ridiculous myths about inbreds. I mean purebreds. <laughs> We've taken man's best friend, a companion who has been with us for hundreds of thousands of years, and transformed them into unhealthy, drooling, and deformed beasts, all to make them more marketable and line the pockets of a few rich bastards. So Rocco, I'm sorry. I've always told the story about how machismo almost killed my dog as a tongue-in-cheek lesson on the perils of toxic masculinity, but it wasn't until recently that I really thought about how it was the capitalists who set the stage for the entire thing. It's the intersection where class and gender meet. Thankfully, people have been taking notice and some things have changed. A countercultural movement towards better breeding standards is emerging. Hopefully, the fate of pets like Rocco will be spared for his future brothers and sisters. Case closed. I'm fucking out of here. This video was brought to you by everyone who helped me buy a new laptop and all of my Patreons. Special shout out to my K9 commanders, Hazil, Breadbeard, Oliver, Lucy, and Daniel. Thank you so, so much, y'all. Peace.